Okay, so we're about to begin an interview with uh, Joe Ringwald. Um, it is September 2nd, 2015. We are in Vancouver, and the interviewer, uh, as usual, will be William McRae. So, could you please state your full name? Joseph Peter Ringwald. And your age, please. Oh, I'm 56. 56. Still young for a... <laughs> Going strong. Especially for this project. Yep. <laughs> Where were you born? I was born here in Vancouver. Okay. And uh, what did your parents do uh, when you were young? Uh, my mother primarily raised the four kids, uh, myself and siblings, and my father was a carpenter and design, uh, construction designer. Okay. And uh, you as a child, what did you do for fun? What were your interests, your go-to activities? Uh, other than sports, it was basically work. Oh yeah, I what kind of work did you do? Well, I started work for money when I was six uh, wow. in construction. I was, I'm a first generation Canadian, My parents are from Europe, and we just had to kind of make ends meet. So, and kind of one way to get away from work was to get involved in sports. So okay. I played a lot of sports growing up, but basically it was school, sports, and work. Was it uh, working with your dad mostly? Largely, yeah. Wow, well, at six, wow. And uh, <laughs> he, he, he apprenticed me when I was 10. With, uh, in construction as well. Wow. So um, in school when you were a child, uh, any classes you excelled at or, or you, you were really interested in? Uh, mostly the sciences. Yeah. Uh, okay. Math, sciences, and um, anything dealing with uh, construction, woodwork, metalwork, that sort of thing. Okay. And um, so after high school, what, uh, did you t what did you decide to do? Which path did you take? Well, that was kind of an interesting situation as well. Uh, is interested a little bit in postgraduate uh, or secondary post-secondary mm -hmm. school. And uh, what I ended up finding myself was uh, working in the Navy. It was, I needed a little bit of a, a change, or shall we say my father figured I needed a bit of a change and some discipline. <laughs> and uh, I found it in the military and spent a, lot, a fair amount of time in the Canadian Navy. Was there any pressure or expectation that you were going to do what your dad uh, was doing? Going to there was, I think there's that expectation. Especially with all your experience. <laughs> uh, that plus uh, I'm named after him and he's named after his father. So it's this kind of line of Joseph's. And when you look at our family history through Germany, it's a very long line of Joseph's. And I think there was that kind of expectation, but I was quite rebellious, uh, particularly in my mid to late teens. Uh, and I just kind of found uh, myself in a bit of control through the military. And then eventually I came back, uh, found my way back to uh, construction. And um, it was eventually my father that said, you'll go back to school, you will take engineering, and you will pay for it yourself. <laughs> That's the kind of guy he was. Yeah. And that's what I ended up doing. But yeah. I wasn't intending to go into mining. No. So yeah. So what was your uh, when you first joined the university? What was your um, my intention uh, was to become an electrical engineer. Okay. I'd been working for an electrical engineering company for a short time, and uh, that was my objective. Uh, that kind of got changed at UBC with a number of friends and uh, when a, a number of classmates were in mining and they asked me to come out to an open house and I was really quite intrigued with the speakers, the guest speakers from industry. Um, then they gave me free beer, free beer and pizza. So that kind of sold Always me. helps. Yeah. So and that's how I found out I, I fell into mining. I didn't, okay. And then I realized that I'd actually grown up collecting rocks um, and I had this interest in geology and rocks most of my life. Um, and, how, and then I stumbled across mining in partly this way, but it was also on a, a patrol that I was with the Navy um, up towards Alaska and we had to shelter from a storm and it turned out to be a recently shut down mine. And when I was in the mining department for to hear that uh, guest speakers for the open house, there was the picture of the mine. Um, the department eventually gave me that picture because that basically was the signal. Uh, the full connection and I've never looked back since then I love this industry so what was your first um, what would you consider your first official job in the industry 
I was hired out of uh, UBC um, into a company called Lynx Geosystems, uh, who is developing software for resource modeling and mine design work. So I helped with the development of that software and the application of it starting in the 80s. And at that time, it was a, a very infant part of the industry. Not a lot of people understood that, but it helped a, a handful of us find our way into numerous projects around the world. And what what did the project, uh, the technology do exactly? It was uh, designed for gathering data and modeling it th in three dimensions graphically. Okay. So I guess uh, in many respects, I find myself fortunate that I was part of that transition from paper or manual methods of design into the modern technology of computer systems. Um, so understanding computers, but also the, the software and the development of that technology over the last almost 30 years. Uh, it was really quite fascinating to see that transition. And I think there's still people in the industry that struggle with that transition. Uh, mm -hmm. And it helps us understand uh, the past and the present and that connection. Okay. Uh, so could you, I guess, kind of give us an outline of your career and from there we'll Mm. I'll, I'll get some uh, some questions in there, but uh, yeah, just kind of a quick outline of your career, if you could. Well, I left Lynx to go back and do graduate studies in what I called geomechanics, uh, rock soil mechanics, hydrology, learn more about the rock and the, the nature of the environment that we're working in. Um, and then a friend of mine and I started our own company, a partnership. I eventually bought him out and started working all over the world on my own in the early 90s. Uh, that eventually led to an offer from Placer Dome, and I joined them for a number of years, and that's how I ended up meeting a, a number of key people that I consider critical mentors mm -hmm. in my career and my life. I feel like uh, Placer Dome hired, was, hired a lot of the people I interview in this mm -hmm. part of the country for this project. Well, I think a lot of people recognize that Placer Dome was quite exceptional at mining. Um, and their technical proficiency was, was uh, really at the top of the industry. Um, that as well as what I consider that the social sensitivity um, to mining and the community was very strong in Placer Dome and amongst uh, particularly the, the mentors that I had. Uh, so I worked with Placer until the end of the 90s when the gold price basically collapsed and Placer had to downsize. Then uh, I moved back into consulting, but I'm basically uh, back into consulting with um, in consulting companies, and that eventually led to uh, a job with a junior as an executive. And since 2001, I've largely been involved in consulting groups and juniors um, in management roles at AMAC, for example, and uh, as executives and leaders in. Uh, junior companies for the last almost 15 years. And it's been quite exciting. Been a, I've been fortunate in my career to have worked in a lot of countries and worked on a lot of projects. Uh, more than a dozen have now gone into operation. Uh, so I consider my focus is uh, project development Okay. with a slant towards um, the, the social and environmental um, aspects of responsible mine mm -hmm. development. So and that's part of the, uh, really, if you want to call it, the indoctrination I got at Placer Dome yeah. uh, through that social and environmental sensitivity of, of what we do. Yeah, especially in the 90s, it was it emerged and here, from here as well, from Vancouver especially. Yeah, and that was, it, it was, I, in many respects, um, whether you want to call it the alignment of the stars or the fates, uh, it, it needed to come from here. Uh, Greenpeace started here in a basement, um, so the movement and the change for the industry needed to start here, in basically the same location. Uh, it's been a struggle. Uh, some of us started this process of change in the 90s. The, a very dear friend and colleague of mine, Alistair Kent, he and I decided to uh, take some initiative as industry professionals, and we started doing uh, social responsible um, industry events. And that didn't go off too well with industry in the 90s. Uh, we got threatened. We, we had our jobs threatened. Um, we got chastised a fair amount, but we needed uh, to follow this path. What's, 
sorry, what's the what was the kind of I guess key uh, was there a key event or a key moment in your life where you just you decided yeah we we should concentrate a lot more on sustainable development or what was the the turning point yeah. was in 1998 there was an article in the uh, National Post uh, that I can still quite clearly recall this article it was a, basically a full page in the National Post the first paragraph or two was about a submarine tailings deposition of a project in the South Pacific and a world-class oceanographer had actually spoken out in favor of this type of uh, disposal or storage, if you like, of uh, the tailings from this particular project. The rest of the page, an entire page, was land-based in the technology and a personal attack on that oceanographer. That's when Alastair and I realized that there's something wrong with the equation when the media and society pay attention to non-science rhetoric without paying, without trying to understand what's really going on. Yeah. So we felt that something needed to be done. Still and seems to be happening in the, that's true. a lot of parts of the <laughs> North America, let's say. Yeah. For uh, other things lately. <laughs> in, in many respects. Yeah. Um, the Our society, particularly the, the Western society, is, you know, I love free speech. But unfortunately, um, people need to understand that it's also easy to manipulate people. And truth is hard to find. And some people have labeled me a truth seeker. Uh, I accept the label. Uh, I have no problem in seeking the truth and digging wherever is necessary to find the whole truth. Uh, unfortunately, not many people want to put in that effort. But it is important for us to understand the full truth, whether it be about the mining or climate change or whatever. Uh, let's find it. And only then can we actually get on a path of uh, true change, rather than change for someone's agenda, political power, money agendas. And everyone has an agenda. Mm -hmm. um, what we need to do is find those altruistic agendas rather than the self serving ones. Yeah. So, yeah, we. Uh, Alistair and I put on our first CIM event in the late 90s, okay. a dinner event. Um, it was boycotted. Uh, that led us to approaching the CIM National Council to take on a bigger uh, event. So, and so they offered us the CIM 2002 Annual Conference okay. on the condition that one of us went on to the CIM National Council. So I became okay. the district vice president for BC and Yukon. And the two of us put together the organizing committee and the theme for the 2002 conference, which turned out to be the first sustainable development mining conference in Canada. And that eventually started to lead into this process of sustainable development, corporate social responsibility, and the process of change. So, what would you consider having, uh, what would you consider your big successes um, in that domain, in sustainable development? Well, it's not just myself, but there's a, a, a growing number of people that are paying attention to this. And we recognized years ago that the change that we foresaw for this industry is probably not going to happen in our lifetime, but we can begin the process of change. So I think I consider that a success. There's this, a growing number of people that are determined to, to change not only the industry, but also the image this industry has. Uh, as I like to help people understand, we're all in it together. It's not us and them. Every human on this planet is completely dependent on mining. You can't escape that. And it's important that we all understand that dependency. Uh, you can try to control it, if you want to think of it like a drug. But really what you need to do is manage the relationship around it and maybe manage our dependencies to some degree uh, rather than always being wasteful. Look at it from not only what we're winning from the ground, but what we're throwing into it afterwards as well. Maybe mm -hmm. diminish to that side as well. And it, it all ties around mining. We, all the way from Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Information Age, everything's dependent on this. Absolutely. So 
this is a foundation of conflict in our human society. It's been that way for millennia. Here's an opportunity for Canada to take the leadership role in reconciling that conflict around our natural resources, not just for us, but for everybody. Um, maybe we'll get back to that subject a, a bit later, but um, you had mentioned you know, other names and, and how you're not the only one mm -hmm. who's, who's helped in this movement. Uh, do you have any um, specific people that you consider mentors or, or yeah, mentors or people who've really, really helped out or, or pushed you um, in these regards? Yeah, I'd have to go back to um, Placer Dome again. Um, that's where, whether you're not, you want to credit them or blame those people for inflicting Joe Ringwald on, on the mining industry. Um, the guys like Jim Cooney. Uh, Jim Cooney is the father of the phrase socializes to operate. Yes. And I consider him a, a dear mentor and friend. Um, others, Sandy Laird, uh, John Wilson, the former president of Placer Dome. He, created, he had the courage to start creating at the corporate level a process of change and social responsibility and sensitivity. Uh, that didn't go over well through a diminishing uh, metal price environment. Um, other guys, Jim Gowans was a dear friend um, and then he rose to a very senior leadership in the industry. Uh, and which he just... Uh, sorry? And now he just um, backed out of the... for bare gold. Yeah. Yeah, just stepped down. Yeah, I, I'd like to know the reasons for it. Uh, Jim uh, and all these people that I just mentioned, they're uh, men of incredible integrity. Along with that, you know, there's that senior level that we all consider mentors and teachers. But through the journey as well, there are people that I, I come to consider friends. And whether or not you want to consider them from industry or outside of industry, uh, there are a number of people that have impact on me. Um, you mentioned Ian Thompson and Susan Joyce. They dealt greatly with that, the social aspect of the industry. But I've engaged with some tremendous people um, that some would consider enemies of the industry, like Catherine Cummins from Mining Watch. What an incredible mind and a passion there. And I learned so much from her on what that civil society perspective is, which many of us in industry get too distanced from. And we need to really uh, pull back to our neighborhood to figure out what that is. So she helped me a great deal with that. And there are others um, within civil society in the movements and um, just friends and neighbors that help, help us uh, in industry come down to earth. Because in the end, we're part of civil society too. It's not, again, it's not an us and them. We all have to come to terms with what we do as an industry and how we impact our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Um, were there, and I'm sure there were, but were there um, any jobs or projects you did in your career that uh, you consider quite to have been quite dysfunctional? <laughs> mm. um. mm. Okay, there is one that, uh, well, there's probably more than one, but there's one that that Stick question um, <laughs> calls to mind. Um, not sure I really want to get into all the details, but there was one job in particular where I, where I was the vice president, and what it eventually led to was a battle on my own personal ethics and integrity. And I still consider it a turning point in my career and one of the most difficult times in my personal life, uh, where for months I had to struggle with the challenge here of um, accepting a lot of money or walking away from that. And in the end, uh, for whatever reason, through um, guidance and my faith advisors and so on, and my family, I decided to walk away from it. And part of that, my legal advisors um, convinced me that I had to be a whistleblower. It was a very difficult and challenging time, um, but that was a, a necessity in, with this process of social responsibility and corporate responsibility in our industry. Um, it's still going, these sorts of behaviors still happening in the industry today, but it becomes personal challenges for people to face up to them and, and deal with them head on. Mm -hmm. And I think that was also a critical challenge and change for myself that eventually led to 
one of those mentors asking me to take over his position on the board of directors for Transparency International Canada, which is the group that represents anti-corruption for Canada. I, I was just about to lead into that because uh, you, you were um, on a standards, standards Council of Canada's mirror committee mm -hmm. for anti-bribery. Yeah. Could yeah. you tell me a bit about that work? Well, again, I think it came down to that decision about 15 years ago, well, 12 years ago now, um, to do I go the direction of that uh, monetary or material value or in a different direction. Um, and it, it was a lot of money, so it was a, a difficult decision. And, it, um, and I think that really it was a defining a moment in my life to determine which path I really wanted to follow in life. And that eventually, doors started just opening. The first was a, the offer to be a director of Transparency International. Um, that eventually led to other doors, including um, helping to create and open up the CSR Center for Excellence with the federal government. Uh, and with those two relationships, um, I was asked to join the Canadian Mirror Committee uh, for anti-bribery mm -hmm. and we're working on the global standard ISO, that's the International Standard Organization for anti-bribery with a multinational group. Uh, and I think it's important that people, uh, whether they chose this path in life of ethics and integrity to, from an early stage where they discovered later on in life that they are the people that need to be defining these standards so that uh, it's not a, a standard that comes out for a particular agenda, but for the right reasons. That we're, we don't necessarily cater to, but we, we, I hope we're guiding global norm behavior and re in some respects responding to that norm behavior. Uh, corruption is an evil that needs to be dealt with. Um, and it's not just an evil against people, but also uh, directly, uh, but also to our entire global financial institutions. Um, and where we're, wherever we see human rights challenges, I can guarantee you're going to see corruption. They're tied together. And unfortunately, we have so, such a great focus on human rights that we're forgetting about the corruption. Yeah. And we have to deal with the human rights, but if, you, if you're uh, just dealing with the symptoms and not the cause. Um, we may not ever get to solve the human rights challenges of the world. Yeah. And part of these human rights challenges are tied directly to our industry. So let's dig deeper, get to the truth, and deal with it from the foundation up. Do you still, uh, do you still work uh, on that committee? No, uh, I, <laughs> a year ago I had to resign or retire from the Board of Transparency International. We are mandated to a maximum of six years on the board. Okay. Um, I guess now I could go back to the board, but I'm actually on the Extractive Ministry Committee with Transparency International. And about a year and a half ago or so, we created a, an anti-corruption workshop that we've now presented a few times. Uh, and we're expanding that workshop and hopefully presenting it for the field, not just within Canada, but uh, hopefully through Department of Foreign Affairs, take okay. it outside of Canada. Who's the, so who's that workshop uh, specifically aimed for? Anyone who's, in business, basically. Anyone in business. Okay, not necessarily mining or the natural no, resources. No, it, it applies to any, okay. any group. Uh, we, we try to help people understand uh, anti-corruption compliance and checklists. We provide all this information. We have a group of presenters from legal, accounting, uh, enforcement, the RCMP is tied in with this, uh, government is, uh, and those of us that have encountered corruption firsthand. Uh, I've seen corruption firsthand from what I call all sectors, government, industry, and civil society groups. No one's innocent. Um, and every, people may not like the statement, but everybody has their price. None of us are exempt from what I call the uh, the corruption continuum that starts with uh, nepotism, collusion, corruption, bribery, all the way to extortion. It's all one continuum. And uh, we have to understand how vulnerable we are to that. 
because it's at the core and the root of just about just about every evil you can think of. Do you think it's get it's a uh, think it's an issue that's getting better? Yes, the last three years in particular, uh, there have been a number of events in the world that are drawing greater and greater attention to corruption. So, in my, part of the work that I've done. Um, the Extractive Sector Transparency Measures Act that came into, got royal assent in December and came into full force in June of this year. Uh, some of us worked for years on that. Um, my involvement goes back to a member of parliament almost four years ago. Uh, I don't know how he got my name, but he called me up and we started talking about a draft bill. And that eventually led to industry and civil society working together. An unusual event to come up to a common platform that we all agreed on and next thing you know the uh, this government um, put it through as faster than we expected um, but this was in my view it was critical for Canada to take a lead role on this um, transparency which is part of fighting corruption mm -hmm. uh, but transparency in particular with the extractive industry and through that process and the and our greater one of the greatest tools that we have for fighting corruption is transparency. Um, and one of the greatest industries susceptible to corruption is the extractive industry, oil and gas mining. Um, whether it's real or perception, well, in many cases perception is truth, uh, we do see these things and we're all vulnerable to it. Uh, but somehow you got to get through this. Mm -hmm and drawing attention to it is one way to do it. Uh, one of the analogies we like is mothers against drunk driving. When I was a teenager, it was okay to drink and drive, basically. You, know, you could have open uh, uh -huh. drinks in your car, and you get pulled over, just put it away. Uh, nowadays, largely because of that civil society drawing attention to poor be behavior, we went through a process of change. It took 20, 30 years. Yeah, yeah. you're seen as a pretty bad person today if you exactly. can drive. Why Absolutely. can't we do the same thing with respect to corruption? Um, draw the attention to it. Most countries of this planet, this world now are doing that because corruption is big business. Do you think um, because, I mean, if we look at the extractive business especially, do you think because it is, uh, or the natural resource industry in general, because it is under often under media scrutiny or just the general public scrutiny uh, and because of um, very easy access to information now in the social media age do you think that's also helped yes uh, lately yeah the you know, people now say large because of a book that came out some years ago the world is flat and it's flat because the information flows instantly and this is actually we all need to embrace this it's a good thing on the condition that the information is at least partially based on fact. And we all need to be uh, uh, scrutineers. Um, David Suzuki wrote an article about eight years ago um, with his advice to new high school graduates. He's skeptical. Check your sources, um, yeah. get your information from multiple sources. When we were young, you had to go into the, the stacks in the library, um, go through books and books to find information. It was hard to get information. Now the information flows in support of almost any argument. So yeah, it's absolutely. important for all of us to be skeptical, but not cynical. Yeah. And in doing so, we'll eventually get to the truth. And those who are the cynics and the ones that are intentionally trying to damage the information and society will eventually be exposed. I'll let the information flow. Mm -hmm. um, now, going back a bit early in your career, as um, when you were, um, you worked for Copper North, didn't you? Uh, right now, I'm an advisor. Oh, right to, now. Yeah, sorry. I'm an advisor to Copper North now. Okay, you're an advisor. I'm I actually, my primary role is I'm the CEO of Selwyn Resources. Okay. And but that doesn't take being junior in this market right now. It doesn't take up all my time. Okay. So. I basically uh, contract some of my time out to Copper North and then one other client. Do you still work full time or is it kind of a almost semi-retired? Um, 
between three clients right now, it's almost full time. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not something that I need to push for. Right now, as an industry, and whether it be a personal choice or industry choice, things are a little slow. Yeah, I, yeah I hear. Uh, I think many of us, um, certainly I am, very concerned about the next rise in the industry. What we went through in 2004, 2005, with a sudden uh, extreme activity in the industry, that was difficult. This next time around, if the same thing happens, could be extremely difficult. Uh, many of us are more than a decade older. And doing 68 hour weeks for months on end, uh, it'll be a bit of a challenge for us older guys. <laughs> we'll need a lot of these older, older guys to yeah. help support us get through this next round. Yeah. Do you foresee uh, a next round coming soon? Or? Yeah. yeah, I do. And uh, you were also, you're a project manager, right, for Copper North? Right now, yeah. Okay. So I'm an advisor and project manager project, for their okay. project in the Yukon. Okay. Um, could you talk a bit about, because um, project manager can be a, a pretty tough job at times, mm -hmm. could you talk about the, uh, I guess, the the good and the bad, uh, or um, the the tough and the easy, or the successes and the, the failures uh, of, of managing a project, for example, the one in the Yukon? Okay. Uh, whether it's in a good time or a bad time, um, project managers are always kind of stuck in the middle. Uh, and I think it, it also comes down to a personal choice. As a project manager, what do you really want to focus on with respect to the development of a project? Um, some choose to just focus on the technical. Uh, in my view, the technical is actually the easy part of the, the overall project management. You have people to manage, but you also have the process and people that often um, in traditional uh, project development you don't recognize as other people that you need to manage mm -hmm. and those are the, the ones outside the industry so project managers also need to deal with that social license to operate and that social license to operate starts when your geologist first hit the ground whether it be from geochem, geochem sample soil samples or even before then all the way down to mine closure that's your social license uh, path. And project managers need to be sensitive to that. You can have the best project in the world, but if you fail on your social license, you can lose the whole thing. Um, and some people have difficulty using the phrase social license to operate these days. I, you call it Fred. I don't care what you want to call it. It's still there. You still have to go through a process of not only regulatory acceptance, but community acceptance for your, your project development. And it would be the same whether you're building a mine or you're building a house in a neighbor, uh, densely populated neighborhood. Um, it has impact. Mm -hmm. And there is typically going to be somebody that doesn't like it. So that falls on the project manager just as heavily as it does on the executives of the proponent. There's also, um, I, I've had someone tell me who was also a project manager tell me you're not only a project manager as well you could be a you know you could be a, a marriage counselor there's there's everything that has to do with the, the people that work under you uh, on the project any difficulties or or um, yeah difficulties or, or stories about uh, about the difficulties of managing uh, the actual people mm -hmm. especially in remote areas that can get quite tough as well. I've considered myself uh, very fortunate in working in a lot of countries and largely I think because of the way I was brought up. Um, being a, a first generation Canadian and, and shall we say not affluent uh, growing up, um, relationships were are important and, we, and that interaction with people became important from us early on. Uh, I learned a lot more when I was an officer in the military because uh, you actually have to lead people and um, encourage them or motivate them to risk their lives. In this industry, uh, particularly in mining, which is a dangerous industry, you may not have to take them that far, but it is a dangerous industry mm -hmm. and uh, they're doing going to do things that they won't always be happy with. 
you don't want to challenge their integrity, but sometimes you have to challenge their motivations. Uh, that happens not only on the ground, but it particularly in the development of a project. Uh, we're, we bring change as an industry. That's what we do. We develop the infrastructure, we develop economic stimulus, and that automatically brings change. And change is challenging to people, which is kind of interesting because we all change every day of our lives. But as an industry person, to bring a, a rather large or a significant process of change and a, hopefully a choice of change, uh, sometimes it's difficult for people to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had to deal with that firsthand with community people and media in different countries. Uh, to me, I find it exciting. Uh, it's part of the human element. One of my mentors, again, at Placid Dome, um, a very senior person, he once said to me, uh, and he used to be a very senior in Placid Dome, he once said that he didn't even tell his neighbors around his home what he did largely for fear of repercussions amongst his friends and neighbors. I thought that was a sad story. Yeah. And then well, he, he, he also... He didn't tell them what he did uh, as a, specifically or at all? At all. Wow. Yeah. And he said that if he, if he had his choice to go back in time, he would focus on the humanities courses, not the science courses. Because that's basically the way our industry is going. Uh, it may be a, an over... Uh, over uh, reaction to what we're encountering and what we have been encountering for over a decade. But uh, there's some truth to this. Uh, as leaders in the industry, we actually have to become more social than technical. The technical is actually quite the easy part these days. Uh, we're quite adept at this, yeah. particularly the Canadian mining industry. It's a bit more predictable than people. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. we, 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 well, although you get surprises. You, know, you, know. you get uh, tailings failures and, and other issues that surprise you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that you can throw all the engineering work that you can possibly throw at it for whatever cost. And you still get surprised. We're dealing with Mother Nature. She has some surprises up her sleeve. Yeah, after as we saw. Yeah. yeah. But the, the human element is very difficult to predict. Um, and only time and communication and integrity um, and working with the community, that's what you need. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of people, have, have you ever, in your line of work, did you ever see any social issues, like um, whether it's violence or drug abuse or things like that? Were there ever any issues that affected uh, people or, uh, yeah, or even projects? That you worked on? Boy, some good questions. <laughs> uh, yes to all of those. Uh, I've even had a weapon in my chest. Um, I've had to deal with drug and alcohol abuse, my own people. Uh, I've had to remove them from sight. Uh, I've seen firsthand corruption and violence break out on sites. Uh, one project, we had a sniper shooting into the office. Um, yeah, this, this, and, it, and it is not restricted to any particular developing nation or anything like that. It happens everywhere. Uh, it's the human interaction. And we're at the core of human society, right? The base foundation being mining and providing all the commodities for everything. Uh, we seem to stimulate certain reactions in people. <laughs> uh, what you do is you face it and deal with it head on as best you can. Some of it you can deal internally. Um, others, they have to go external. One of them, we ended up doing a multinational um, police investigation, including Interpol. Yeah. Um, these things happen. Unfortunately, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, not all this information comes to light. So things like that investigation never did come out uh, because it, it was felt by the politicians involved as well, that it was best to keep it under wraps. Why? Uh, one of it was from the legal standpoint, because we did keep it all silent, and they did eventually find the fraudulent individual uh, and the group that he was associated with. But from a legal standpoint, there was no financial or physical damage. 
therefore there was no way to prosecute. And in fact, what we eventually learned was that it was intended for us to go public with this and the damage would actually have fallen on us because who would believe the mining industry and some perceived corrupt politician? Yeah. Right. Even, though, even if we did have the truth, some people just don't want to hear the truth. Mm -hmm. um, so you wonder how many other truths are out there that are being hidden. Yeah. Which is, again, a sad state that right now society is is not want to hear the entire truth in many respects. Yeah. Well, like uh, exciting uh, career, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, keeping on the, the, the social part of things, um, women were, uh, and this might have changed throughout your career, but how absent or present were women in, um, in your career, throughout your career? When I did my undergrad, um, we were a larger class at UBC and we had um, two women um, in our class. Uh, through the years, it, the growth in the number of women really hasn't grown beyond that in my view. Uh, to me, that's a sad state. Uh, I've worked with women, they've worked for me, and I've worked for some. And in every case, it's been tremendous. Uh, I've hopefully, I hope they consider me a mentor or at least a friend, some that were going through their graduate studies, uh, masters and PhDs, that uh, I follow carefully. And they are now very successful in the industry, and I don't think it has anything to do with my involvement. But to watch them develop as professionals has been tremendous. Uh, a couple of them, I wish the industry would pay attention to these young women as potential board members. The women um, that go through this, the, the industry in this process, uh, the ones that warrant recognition, because uh, I don't, I'm not a, um, uh, I can't remember the phrase for it, um, uh, bringing in a, a race or a gender for the sake of adding the numbers, or positive, affirmative action. Yeah, affirmative action. Yeah. I can't agree with affirmative action. But on the, the converse of that, don't reject somebody because of their gender or their race when they have the qualifications. And some women that I know, put them on the board. You'll get some insight that you never expected. And uh, I've worked for a couple of companies where the women on the board were actually the intelligent ones on the board. Um, uh, and perhaps the more ethical ones. So we need to open this industry up to that and encourage them to come in. There, I don't know if you're able to explain this, but there's a, I mean, <clears throat> women in university, that's increased incredibly. There's, mm -hmm. there's more women than men now. And it's increased more also in all this, the STEM department. Um, but there still seems to be less women who go into these fields afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, do you know why? Or Well, I suspect, I suspect in our industry, um, particularly uh, a couple of things. One is, it is certainly a male-dominated industry. And when you get into the operations, there's certain uh, carryovers from the old days in the way that men behave uh, on site. Um, they may think it is humorous, and in some cases, you know, other men will find it humorous, but it's not always respectful, not even to other men. Um, for women to step into that takes a very special woman. Yeah, it's tough. Right, it's very difficult. Um, I wouldn't say it's all that different to what the women who are do going through in the RCMP. Um, it's a challenge. Uh, I've seen many do that. And those are the women, get them on the boards and help them uh, effect the change to, the, to this industry that it needs. So that's one. The other is, it is typically a remote industry. You have to be willing to be away. Um, and that's difficult on men and women. Doesn't matter what your gender is, it's difficult. Uh, for me, I was fortunate to have a life partner, my wife, that it was difficult in the, the early years, but eventually she embraced my travel. So in our first 30 years, we added it up. I'd been away 12 years out of that 30 years. Wow. So we've been apart. She likes to say that's why we're still married. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, 
people have to accept that aspect of our industry. Even if you're doing fly in, fly out in your base, wherever, you have to accept that you're going to be white. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps some women just have a challenge with that, um, accepting that as a premise for getting into this industry and working the operations. Uh, even if it's for a few years, working in the operations is actually important because uh, it gives you that foundation for making decisions later on in life. Mm -hmm. so. um, in your opinion, are there any um, events, this is a, a broader question, but are there any events, people, inventions, contributions, disasters, anything really that, that you believe must be mentioned when talking about the uh, modern history of the natural resources in Canada. So it could be from today to the last hundred years or so. Is are there are there specific things you believe must be mentioned or discussed when talking about the subject? Um, I'd have to say from my my per yeah, personal sure. perspective. Absolutely. There there are I think a lot of people will, will focus in on certain technologies. Uh, whether it be the the advent of the computer technology, um, Canada is responsible for for some tremendous stuff, um, particular software uh, that we use in um, resource development these years or these days, uh, and there are equipment and modern technologies uh, with remote equipment. From my personal perspective, um, I like to focus in on policy changes. Okay. Uh, I think Canada is a leader in the process of change for the global mining industry from the perspective of policy. So whether you call it social license to operate, corporate social responsibility, transparency, all of these are important to the process of change that the industry must go through. We have to recognize that our industry, yes, we utilize technology, but no amount of technology is necessarily going to get you on the ground. It is how we approach the the natural resource itself, and the, which includes the communities around it, that's how we're going to eventually keep this industry going. And we have to keep the industry going for the sake of global civil society because we're in a symbiotic relationship. You can't; one cannot live without the other. And I believe Canada is a global leader on that social sensitivity on the development of this industry and new policy and new tech, new approaches on what I like to call designing for closure, um, which includes right from the exploration phase, construction and operation with the closure and what this project is going to look like after we're done. That's where we need to get to. Many are already on that path and already fully have it, have it integrated, but we all need to be there. Mm -hmm. We are temporary users of the land, and we must be respectful when we're doing it. Thank you. Um, just a, a fun question here. You said you traveled a lot. What, uh, what's been your favorite uh, spot? Mm. Or spots? Uh, spots? <laughs> um, God. Been to all of the continents except Antarctica. Not bad. Uh, <laughs> but um, I keep saying one of my favorite countries was Turkey. Yeah. Uh, started in Turkey, I was it late 80s, early 90s. My first trip in there, yeah. Um, and we were, I was part of the first internationally owned mining project in Turkey. So we had the design group in Germany and then we moved over to Turkey in the early 90s. And the curtain had just fallen. Uh, I was fortunate to have been in Berlin to help knock down the Berlin Wall. Wow. Um, so I got pieces of that and photos wow. of that experience. That's a story. Yeah, that was, uh, and my father being German and True, yeah. a, a teenage conscript into the German army at the end of the war uh, that had certain uh, appeal to me and, and resonated well knocking down that wall uh, but it, in that transition in the early 90s of the, the curtain coming down northeastern Turkey where we were working uh, went through a tremendous change there was a lot of uh, what they called the Russian markets so a lot of material is coming out of Georgia and other parts of Russia and was being sold in, at the, in Turkey, which was the footsteps into Europe. Uh, so we got to see a lot of change. Okay. Um, and that was exciting. It was exciting to see that process of government control to industry involvement 
um, and opening up uh, the industry in Turkey. But on top, but most of all, the people were amazing. These are they were people of incredible passion and freedom and life in themselves. Uh, I never felt more alive and free than in Turkey. Uh, there's a, a phrase they say, inshallah, trust in God. They live that every day of their life. So even if you wanted to walk across the street, here in Vancouver, you walk across between the lights, you have to worry about getting a ticket for jaywalking. There, you worry about getting hit by a car, right? Your life is in your own hands. <laughs> You're not worried about this law or that law or anything like that. But if you chose to break the law, the circumstances are severe. There's no slap on the wrist or anything like that. So you really had your life in your own hands. You're accountable to yourself and everybody around, not to some little rule here or law there or anything like that. It was real life. Everything or nothing. Every, everything and nothing, <laughs> right? There's another phrase that we learned over there, trust in God, but tie up your camel. Right? So live your life to the fullest. Yeah. And, and we did there. It was a brilliant uh, people. How long did you stay? I was in and out for about three years. Oh, okay. Um, you really got to know the place. Oh, yeah. Loved it there. Hmm. Um, what, uh, what are you proudest of in life? And I mean, this can be a, a tough, broad question, so we can split it in half if you want. To, hmm. You could be proudest of in life in general and also professionally. And it could be more than one. That's also a tough part. Um, hmm. I think I really have to tie it all together. Sure. Um, the, one um, family member and I we had a discussion many years ago. Uh, this is basically to illustrate some context. Um, he had really talked about how he's different at work from at home. Um, I always had a problem with that. I don't like to be different at home than from work. Uh, stresses are different, pressures on you and your decisions are, are different. But to me, you should be true to yourself and yeah. be the same person wherever you are. Transparency. Um, so I think, um, and it really goes back to somewhat to the way I was brought up, but certainly to my military experience and my mentoring through Placer Dome and the, the, the key decision I had to make. Um, the development of the, uh, the ethics and integrity, uh, which I like to stand for. Um, that's what I'm really kind of proud of. The technical um, and the ability in this industry, I love doing this. Uh, but it, the, that ethic uh, of where we need to go within the industry and perhaps in global society as well, that's what I'm most proud of. And that's what I'm most protective of. Um, it's not just about reputation. You know, people will attack the reputation of the best of people, and I'm not saying I'm one of those. Um, but we must protect our principles uh, as a global society. Uh, I like to think of myself as a social capitalist. Um, I believe in the people, uh, the global village. Marshall yeah. McLuhan's mm -hmm. global village. I believe in that. We're all the same at the core of who we are as humans on this, this little globe. Um, but we also have to recognize that you can't run this world on debt. Um, and to generate uh, IOUs, left, right, and center, is not being responsible, and that's not ethical. Uh, so sometimes part of this equation is just being patient. That you can be patient without being rude. And, and you can work with people without having to be wealthy. Uh, at the same time, nothing wrong with making money. It's how you make it and how you spend it that yeah. really defines the individual. Um, last question. Um, if you were speaking to someone much younger, like a student, for example, um, what would be the life lesson or the one piece of advice you could give them going forward?
if a, if it was a student in in our industry, particularly for the engineering students, recognize that you may have got your degree, um, but it'll take a life to determine for you to become an engineer. Recognize that uh, by choosing this path to be becoming a professional engineer, um, and, and it's unfortunate that in some professional engineering associations, they have to mandate professional development requirements. When those of us from year that started years ago, you make a commitment to that when you be when you choose to become an engineer. Um, when you retire, that's when you're an engineer. In the meantime, live and learn, and never stop. Thank you. Is there uh, is there anything else you'd like to add or or share? Uh, I think it just whoever is watching. To me, this is one of the, the most profound and important industries the world has to offer. Done right, a mine, um, a responsible mining operation can benefit locally and globally. And it's important for all of us to recognize that uh, this industry is at the foundation for all of us. At the same time, we must recognize that as global citizens, we have a duty and responsibility to understand the industry and give it its respect and space to deliver what it needs to for all of us to survive. We're in it together. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.